Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today on Google Developers Live. We're going to be talking about App Engine. My name is Danny Hermes. I'm a developer programs engineer, and I work on the cloud platform, specifically on App Engine. Joining me today is literally an expert, one of our Google developer experts, uh, Alex Vagin. I'll let him introduce himself a bit. Hey, guys. Um, I'm Alex. I'm, um, uh, I'm actually I'm Ukrainian, but I've been in Italy for the past 10 years. I don't know. I think I like it here. Anyway, so, uh, uh, yeah, like, looks like I'm a developer expert, and um, I love, you know, working on these edge technologies. So, yeah, that, that's me. Yes, Alex is a rock star when it comes to Golang, uh, when it comes to App Engine, when it comes to Auth. I mean, you name it, uh, Alex has played around with it. It's, uh, it's pretty great working with him. Uh, and it's nice to see external developers really take an interest. It makes my job that much that much better. So why are Alex and I here to talk to you today? So uh, Alex took on a uh, pretty large experiment that ended up turning out something really awesome. Uh, and that experiment was getting cloud endpoints working on Go and PHP. So uh, without further ado, let me jump in uh, and start the first of three demos. Uh, the the first two of which will uh, will start right at the beginning. So, uh, really fast because I'm actually running this locally uh, and and I win uh, you know if we refresh again we get signed in again we see my win uh, and so this is tic-tac-toe uh, I, I will uh, dispel the mystery uh, this is the Python runtime so this is what the tic-tac-toe app looks like uh, it's it's making requests in the background to the API uh, and it's it's you know it's not it, it's, it's asynchronously loading the data and just Every single time we refresh, we start out with a single web page. You know, you need to sign in, and we're using actual AC. harder to lose than it is to win. Uh, sorry, there's a bit of a JavaScript bug that makes the score not reload when it should. So I have the most recent score loading after the, the, the current score. Anyhow, uh, so Alex, what is the difference between this tic-tac-toe and the last tic-tac-toe that we saw? Right, so you guys, you can see that the, the visually there's, there's basically no difference. If you if you took the JavaScript, CSS, and images from Python version, you know you, you took it and you copied it somewhere. But then uh, instead of writing your backend in uh, in Python, you you write it in in, in in Go. You know, so you create your your backend, your uh, cloud cloud endpoints uh, in in writing Go, right? So you can basically you can you can so what we did we we swapped backends and we left the client side as it is. And you know it just works. Yes, this is this is the beauty of cloud endpoints and and more generally discovery-based APIs. But but specifically with cloud endpoints, since uh, the the surface area of the API that gets consumed by an application, which is you know a discovery-based API, since it looks exactly the same, we have this standard format. Like Alex said, we can actually swap out the backend entirely and not change the front end at all. 
and it actually works perfectly with the, 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 uh, the Google API client libraries. You know, here we're using uh, Gappy or Google API JavaScript client, but you, know, you can use many of our client libraries in many different environments. So, are we live? All righty. Sorry about that. Uh, some technical difficulties here. Our, our live streamer uh, conked out for a bit, but we're back. Uh, so uh, as I was saying, our, our client libraries, as well as the standard discovery-based interface for an API, allows us to, uh, to interact with it without changing the front end at all, but completely having a brand new back end. So Alex is going to talk about uh, how, how we made this happen, the, the actual code that he wrote to make this library work. But before that, I want to give a, a general idea of why this is uh, possible from an overarching sort of app engine side. So for, for those who are familiar, um, I, I don't expect many will be just because it's, it's a very low level thing. But there are a fair amount of services within app engine which make RPCs, uh, remote procedure calls, uh, with you know, a provided method name and, and uh, uh, you know, some, some standard input, uh, and it sends a protobuf sort of below the runtime to a, a lower level service. So for example, uh, the OAuth API. Uh, if you want to get the OAuth current user, the library code really just wraps an RPC uh, and is able to, to parse the protobuf that it receives back from the RPC uh, in, into something usable, right? And so for things like this, as we get new runtimes, uh, you know, we're, we're able to actually uh, you know, just, just simply write this wrapper and the, the sort of hard work is already done, right? And so the analogy here for cloud endpoints is that this was also true. So uh, for people familiar with cloud endpoints, either from the Java side or the Python side, what would happen is uh, you, would, you would put a path in your handlers for slash underscore A8 thing is a special JSON configuration file, uh, which allows the, uh, the Google's API infrastructure to actually determine what your backend looks like. And so, in understanding what your backend looks like, you're, it's actually able to figure out how it needs to send requests from the front end, which is things coming through Google's API infrastructure, to your backend, your SPI. And so, for example, for tic-tac-toe, if our API, if our backend was called tic-tac-toe API, and we had we had a method called get score, then we would we would let uh, we would let it know that tic-tac-toe dot scores dot dot get. Um, this thing we've seen in the APIs Explorer before maps to the path underscore ah slash spi slash tic tac toe api dot board get move, and really uh, you know a combination of this this routing serving these spis and putting it in this config is all that needs to be done to actually make this work. So this is sort of the same thing as the RPCs in that uh, all, all the infrastructure needed to make this work is already there. It's just a matter of having a library uh, provided for it. And so I'm not going to get into the details too much of, of what this API configuration file looks like, but this is sort of, uh, in addition to the SPI routing, all that needs to be done. Uh, and uh, after we go into some, some good details about what Alex has done, uh, I, I'm going to demo uh, a very, very... Input and output. And we, using Reflect, we go through each field in, in your structures and, you know, we, um, we kind of disassemble your, 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 your uh, structs and, and that's where we get information um, sufficient to generate the API config, which is then, you know, taken by the API infrastructure and then it generates the um, uh, a discovered document. Yep. So, and what you, what you see on the screen is just, uh, you know, a small piece of, uh, um, of, of the code where, you know, um, it looks at the, uh, the type of, of a field and it sort of guesses, not, not guess, but you know, it, um, it um, recognizes which type, um, it, uh, which type of the field it is. It, and, you know, the, the types are, um, field, field, field types are, are they're strictly defined by the API configs and and uh, discovery document. You can you, you probably saw it on on uh, developers.google.com. Yep. Right. And so here, for example, we we have essentially on the left are the the native JSON types, and on the right are are these actual native types, 
which are supported in, in places like Go, but aren't necessarily supported like in JavaScript, right? So uh, if we have int 64, the max precision of a JavaScript integer is two to the 53. So we actually have to have this data as a string to actually be held in, in JSON and, and not lose precision, right? Uh, do you want me to pop up to another part of API config or do you want me to, to, to go over to the example, Alex? Um, I don't know how much, uh, maybe we have too little time. Okay. Maybe we should go cool. to the example. All right. So here we are. Just, you know, I mean, uh, since, you know, it's, it's open source, right? So then, you know, uh, everybody can go to GitHub and, and see what has done, you know. Sure. Uh, sure, yeah. So, right. And uh, uh, besides, you know, the uh, types and, and stuff like that, there, there are also um, things like you want to make some fields required or uh, you want to define a default value, you know, all, all those, all the stuff that, you know, you, you could use that, you know, API, that um, discover document supports. So uh, uh, we added this, uh, if you're familiar with uh, JSON tag, where you, you know, you specify in, uh, field name and type, and then um, uh, a string that basically defines how uh, your JSON is going to look like. So what we did was we, we created an, um, a new tag called endpoints, where you can specify all sorts of, of things uh, related to to discover document. There are, uh, currently there are just four, but uh, I think, no, actually there are five. Five, yeah. But um, I think they're gonna be more in, in the future. Yep. So, so you know, uh, right now you can define, uh, you can say that uh, I want this field to to make uh, required, or I want to define default value, or a minimum, minimum, uh, minimum and maximum, and you can also define description. And then this information is going to be seen by your, uh, you know, JavaScript or any other client, so that they can understand, you know, which, how, you know, uh, what, uh, what kind of data and format you, uh, your backend expects on on the, on the input. Right? Yep. Cool. So you want me to All pop right. over to the next? See it, yeah, see okay. it used? Okay. Um, cool. Okay, yeah. So this is right. This is how you you can you know get started with uh, with this end, endpoints uh, package. Um, what you see is greeting this uh, struct type. It's uh, it's just uh, oh by the way this is uh, a simple example from uh, from Gaspel from if you go to you know, developers.com and documents on uh, Go runtime, it's, you'll see uh, almost exactly the same thing. Sure. So you see there's a great thing, uh, and this is uh, kind of sort of object that will be, you know, visible as a, um, a guest book uh, message and, and greeting, right, which has four fields. And and then there's another type, a greetings list, which is also a struct, and that this type defines um, Basically, what it defines is a list of greetings, and it is used when, you know, when we want to fetch, when we want to get uh, a list of greetings from our you know, um, guest book from, from from the back. Right for queries. For queries, right. And the third one is uh, greetings list uh, request. This is um, um, this this struct is not visible, but we use it to define. Um, Parameters that we want uh, that we 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 can expect, you know, on on, on our backend uh, input. Yep. And in this case, it's just a limit that you know that indicates like uh, client can indicate how many items um, the client wants to get from from the guest book. Sure. Right. So those are those were uh, like data uh, structure and, and format. And uh, second part is what we actually define. We we'll write our uh, backend methods, and as you can see, there's only there's only one list method that uh, that gets uh, fetches um, guest book messages from from uh, from data store, and um, it uh, and then you know uh, yeah. let me see what it does. All right, so <laughs> it does it doesn't do really much. It just fetches the entities from data store and. And that's it. And it responds with at the end you see it return nil. That means no error. And so uh, the client will get successful response. Yep. So 
and so basically this is just you know a simple uh, um, go method right there's nothing specially you need to do um, oh yeah and this is the the last part is uh, kind of a little uh, special this is where you sort of uh, hook your uh, um, so before this part if you if you if you see that there was literally nothing about end points right and this one is the part where you kind of um, Make your, uh, you know, make your service methods discoverable, and this is how you. This is where actually the um, endpoints uh, generates. Uh, not you know, this is where you know you hook your uh, service methods with the endpoints package. Yep. So that you know endpoints, the it, it then knows how to generate uh, API config. Exactly. It can it can take the service and figure out what the structs look like, what the methods look like. And actually, uh, you know, fill in this JSON API configuration for the back end so it can tell Google's API infrastructure what it looks like. Back to, sorry. Yeah, right. And this one last piece that uh, actually I, I forgot to do it when, when I first deployed my app, and this is where Danny actually <laughs> helped me. <laughs> and I felt so stupid because I forgot to add the IH SPI um, uh, URL mapping, right? This is what Danny was talking about before. This is how you, you know, um, and, and in this case, uh, we map it to uh, a special script called Go app. This is because, you know, uh, this is how uh, Go apps are, are, are run on uh, App Engine. And uh, so it goes, um, it should go to our, you know, our app, our, our handler. And what it will, will do actually is it will, uh, it will go to the endpoints handler, a special handler, uh, this backend service, uh, yep. which, Knows how to generate API config, and and this is what the Google's API infrastructure calls to get the API configs, and this is how you know the circle is closed. Now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, in addition to what you just saw, there's a few other things already on Alex's wiki. Super duper helpful. Uh, there's the the typical Go Gopher docs that you're used to seeing. Uh, there's a getting started, which we just saw. Some tips. Uh, and then particular documentation about things like field tags and, and things like that. Um, one thing Alex and I have been working together on uh, over the last two weeks or so uh, is making auth work in endpoints. Now that is a whole another GDL on its own just to talk about auth and endpoints. Uh, but we, we wanted to briefly touch on what is already supported uh, in this library. So Alex, do you want to explain some of that? Um, no, I think I'm. I mean, you. It's. I think it's your part. Okay, great. Uh, so, <laughs> so you know, I, I've just got a few pages here to talk about auth for GitHub. So the first thing is uh, we have a current user uh, object, and we actually have a custom endpoints context. So you're used to constructing an app engine context from your request. We actually have a custom endpoints context to do the the unique things uh, which which endpoints needs for auth, right? And so uh, this current user method takes one of those contexts. Uh, a, a list of potential scopes for the, the tokens being passed in, and of course, a uh, list of acceptable audiences and client IDs. And so the first thing it does, uh, it will actually check uh, for an ID token user. And if there's a valid ID token and a valid user for that ID token, then of course we'll get it back. Uh, and if that fails, it will uh, fall back to checking for a bearer token user. These are the standard things that you're used to seeing, typical OAuth 2 access tokens. Uh, but ID tokens are something which are uh, sort of uh, used, ex not exclusively in Android, but, but the crypto in Android makes it really easy to mint these tokens. Uh, and actually using an ID token is nice because it has some extra data in it, uh, which, which you can get just from, uh, just from deserializing some base64 segments. Uh, and you get JSON out, so, and then you can find then, you know, user. Yeah. So basically, you know, when, when you use this ID token, you you sort of uh, sometimes you can spare um, a round trip to uh, to do you know to do a, a, um, a, le a one less HTTP request, right? Right. So yeah. So so the thing about ID tokens is uh, their their JSON web tokens are JOTs, and the third segment is signed cryptographically, and you can actually verify it server side uh, without making any round trips to make sure the token is valid uh, or or given from Google, as long as you have uh, the the public cert corresponding to the private cert that Google used to, to, to actually sign the token. Uh, and, and we actually do this in our code. And so the thing Alex was saying uh, 
which uh, which I will bounce over to now, is that uh, in in the uh, dev app server case, if we're not in production, if we're in the dev app server, we have a special uh, context factory made just for uh, the the essentially offline case or the local host case, right? And what this special context factory does, it will actually fetch the token info. This is the round trip Alex was talking about. It will it will hit the token info API, which is another discovery based Google API. And it'll say, here's the access token I have. Uh, can you tell me more about it? And so if we had ID tokens uh, on the on the development server, we wouldn't actually have to make this round trip to, to get the token info. Uh, but it's actually possible as well. So we, we have full support for tokens both in production uh, and in the development app server. So you can, uh, you know, like I, I did there on localhost with, with your Wadsworth Testington test account, you can actually find out, you know, if the it's a valid user, if the user's signed in, if the token's good, you know, Everything you'd want to be able to do, it just works out of the box with Alex's awesome Go Endpoints uh, library. So that's about all we wanted to say about the library. Uh, if you have more questions, please throw them in the moderator uh, queue for this event, uh, and we're happy to answer them. Uh, I want to end this with a demo uh, of PHP and then also show you what the API config looks like for this. So uh, what I have here on my screen is the, uh, the Google APIs Explorer. And this explorer is something that you're used to interacting with for Google APIs, but essentially it says, you know, here's a list of discovery-based APIs. We only have one uh, running in this PHP application. Uh, and here's all the list of methods after we go in, and I only have one. Now, the name of this method makes it clear what it does. It, it models, uh, excuse me, it echoes a model. It really doesn't do anything other than return the response, uh, excuse me, return the request that it got. The SPI handler corresponding to myapi.mymodel.echo receives a bit of JSON with the, the needed fields, and it just sends that JSON back. So it's really not doing a whole lot, but the point is, is we're able to spin up a discovery-based API in all four runtimes because the underlying machinery is already there. Uh, so if we go into this method, we see uh, wonderfully provided, due to the discovery doc, um, the APIs Explorer actually knows what the fields are. So we have a myInt and a myString field. So for myInt, I'll pass, uh, actually, let's pass 42, the answer to everything. Uh, and my string, uh, thanks, Alex, because uh, this was great uh, doing this GDL with him. And so if we execute this request, we actually get back an echo uh, of, of what we sent. So, so I want to end this with uh, showing you sort of how this works. So I've got terminal open. I want to full screen this bad boy. Okay. Um, so I've got this application running, um, and it's really only three files. I have a fourth file in just for our sake, but, uh, we have app.yaml, we have hello world.php and we have API config.json. So the first thing I'll just show you hello world.php. Uh, it's really only, uh, it's really only echoing a post, right? It sets the, the, the content type to JSON cause that's what it's sending back. And it, it sends back the raw post data as it got it. Really an echo. Uh, so, so the second thing is app.yaml. So what happens in app.yaml, uh, we're first statically serving the API configuration file. So this is the thing which tells Google's uh, API infrastructure what our backend looks like. And so we're statically serving this JSON file, api-config.json, at the path ah spi backend service dot get api config. This is the thing I was talking about before. And then every other request uh, goes through AHSPI, uh, and, and it's just a glob that goes through this uh, hello world.php. And so that's where our, our backend path uh, actually gets served. So, so the final thing, uh, the final two things I wanted to show you were um, this API config.json and then my API config.json. So the first thing is what's actually getting served to Google's API infrastructure. And it's, um, it's, it's, uh, it's JSON inside JSON. So it's, it's a dictionary with just one key called items, and that key holds a list of JSON serialized API configs. So here we only had the one API called my API. So it's just a list containing the, the JSON serialized version uh, of, of my API. And, I, and it's not, not worth looking at here, but here uh, is, is sort of a more human readable version of this API config. So we see in it at the top, the name, the version, the description, all of these things we saw in the APIs Explorer. Some other things, uh, one thing which is relatively important is uh, that you know it's serving on localhost port 8080. 
Uh, and so we're able to tell our clients sort of how to interact with it and where to interact with it. Uh, and so the root of the API itself is AH API, and the root of the backend uh, is AH SPI. Uh, and you know, this, is, this is how the two parts communicate with each other as well. And so the first thing is we say, we've got some methods. We actually only had one method. We saw it was my API model echo. And then we've got some data about this. So, so uh, the most important one uh, is really, uh, well, actually, it's, it's really the correspondence to another uh, backend method. So the backend method or rosy method is called myapi.mymodelecho. And so if we go over to our uh, descriptor key in this configuration and we see myapi.modelecho, we actually see a, a description of what the data looks like. So the request and the response are, are a reference to a schema called my model. And so this part, uh, the, the, the methods part of the map, tells us uh, take the external facing myapi.model.echo my and map it to myapi.mymodelecho uh, in the back end down here. And, and so in the back end, it actually tells the front end, hey, this is what the data I expect to receive looks like, my model. And here's the data I expect to give you looks like, again, my model. And then finally, the last key in that uh, descriptor key is called schemas. And that, that actually describes what the data looks like. And so our my model schema, again, has a few uh, you know, syntactic things in there. Um, but you know, it, it's, it's got two properties, which is what we saw. My string, which is of type string, and my int, which was an integer, which actually happened to be uh, of type integer. Uh, because it was int 32, the, the, the thing we saw with Alex before, if it were int 64 or you int 64, then it would have been type string, so we could have had uh, you know, JavaScript type safety like that. Uh, so this is what it looks like in the back end, uh, and uh, this is essentially why we can have this PHP uh, Cloud Endpoints app and also the much, much more functional app and library uh, in Go that, that Alex has written. So, before we jump to the moderator and answer any questions there, uh, I want to say if anybody's interested in doing for PHP what Alex did for Go, let me know and I'm happy to help, help you figure out how the API config looks, help you figure out how to actually stand up your SPI or any other particular questions you might have. Uh, I'm, I'm here for you. So uh, now let me jump back over to the browser, uh, go to developers google.com slash live. I should have opened the moderator queue beforehand. That's a fail on my part. But that's okay because our wonderful, uh, our wonderful folks behind uh, Google Developers Live make it so that it's really, really easy just to get to this thing. So there we go. And now I'm in it. Uh-oh. So the first question says, the streaming is co quite bad. Do you have some architecture diagram? So it would be... A, a, at least easier to understand and get the bits of the streaming. I'm not sure. Uh, obviously, there was some sort of a transmission issue on his side. Not sure what it was. Uh, but we don't have an architecture diagram. But uh, that's something I'm certainly uh, happy to do. Um, I, I assume he's sort of uh, you know talking about the way that the particular handle, handlers talk to each other or uh, you know, the configuration works and things like this. Do you have any uh, response to this, Alex? Um, uh, yeah, I think, I think he, he's, uh, he's, he's talking about this, you know, how, how, do, you, how do you connect all, all, all the things together, right? Sure, sure. But then, yeah, I, I know there, there's, uh, uh, there's a document, uh, like an uh, awesome document. When I saw it first, then I, I said, wow, this is what I, what I needed exactly to, you know, to, to finish the uh, uh, cloud endpoints for Go. I mean, the, I'm, I'm talking about the doc. You know, yep, the, yep. The, the so, so essentially, it's documentation for the API config. Yep. yep. Cool. Uh, so there's one other question that I can completely answer, and then a, a third question, with, uh, which is a similar RPC framework for, um, for actually you know, communicating with, with things like this. Uh, and this was something Alex actually considered at the beginning. Uh, and there was a long discussion with the maintainers of Gorilla RPC. Uh, and so in order to actually you know, get this library out and, and do the things he, he uh, needed Go endpoints to do, Alex opted not to use Gorilla RPC initially. Um, there are no current plans to switch. That's not to say that we couldn't, that we won't. It's not to say that we will. Uh, it's it's you know, something 
essentially just academic to something to think about at this point. Uh, is there anything beyond that, Alex? Oh, oh yeah. Oh, I know. I got it with you, man. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was, yeah, I, I, uh, I chose not, not to use Google IPC because, um, you know, um, it would be, um, you know, at first I thought to, just to take real RPC and then just add some stuff and even, you know, like uh, uh, push um, push it like as, as a branch of real RPC and then, uh, you know, submit a pull request. But then I thought, I, I mean, I looked at it and I tried. Actually, I tried, I did try. And I realized there was there's too many things that I had to, you know, uh, to change. And it would break, you know, the current, you know, how, how real RPC works currently. So okay. uh, I feel, you know, I just take what I need for now and uh, go on uh, you know on a separate way but then you know who knows in the future yep definitely. Um, but you know I, I think maybe probably he, he was he was saying about the sort of um, like data format uh, exchange between SPI and, and API mm -hmm. like, so it's just it's just using different format right yep uh, yep so but then uh, that one I don't know how to answer if you if you guys <laughs> have plans to switch but you know, i don't know sure uh so another question popped up right as we were speaking uh and this is a question i don't have the answer to uh and don't want to speculate but the question for for the viewers is will a php runtime support hrd which is the high replication data store and when will it be released to the public um so so when php launched uh the 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 data um the only supported data backend was cloud sql um and uh, you know the higher application data store is not yet supported, so I, I don't I don't have answers to that. But uh, but you know I'm I I will take the questions back to the team and uh, hopefully you know get some more communications on that. So with that, that brings us to the end of our GDL and the end of our moderator queue. Again, thanks a ton to our expert uh, Alex uh, Vagin. Uh, it was it was great to have you, and it's been great working with you, and it will be great working with you as as Go Endpoints uh, matures even more. Uh, so everybody, thanks for joining us. Have a great day. We'll see you. Yeah. Um, can I can I say also? You know, oh sure. Thank you. Thank you back because um, <laughs> you know because <laughs> I, I don't um, I don't think I would have done it you know without your help without the like those you know. API configs description and I don't think you know if you remember what I started from was I tried to generate um, that's right um, discover doc from from scratch and you know and I remember like your comment I uh, like how did you how did you generate that I, um, I hope um, did you do it by you know manually and then, and, and then you wrote I hope not right? <laughs> yes <laughs> and then you know I actually I went back to the uh, um, to the page on, on developersgo.com and and I you know I like uh, I browsed again the whole uh, discovery doc and then you know I saw how how, many, how much stuff was in there and then I thought maybe maybe Dan is right you know <laughs> and when he sh uh, when he shared he really showed me the API configs you know I realized it was just you know <laughs> it wasn't part, I mean it was just what wasn't worth it to to, uh, to, to create uh, you know, Discover Duck from scratch. Yep. So I wouldn't I wouldn't have done it without without your help. Sure thing. I'm glad I could Thank help you. and it was a pleasure working with you. All right. Thanks everybody for coming to this GDL.